these are within easy reach these days. In supermarkets, vending machines, from chocolate bars to cookies, milk, and even chips. I have set myself a challenge to see just how protein crazy the supermarket has gotten. So, I'm gonna try my very best to get as many protein enriched or high in protein foods as I can, all within five minutes. Let's check it out, what do we have here? Nope, no powders. Okay, moving on. Oh, some wellness products. Okay. Got cookies, okay. Protein cookie goes in. We've got some chocolate, high protein bars as well. I'll grab that. Some protein powder, protein crisps. For many consumers, when they see the word protein associated with certain food items, they immediately see it as a signal for a healthy diet. Because of the healthy image, some people see it as a guilt-free snack. <sighs> Anything here? I see some ice cream. High protein ice cream. In the trolley. They're quite functional and very convenient. Milk, 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 milk. Perfect. Running out of time. Let's see if there's any last minute items. Any other drinks? High in protein. Time to check out all our items. And we're done. In just a matter of minutes, I managed to get so many high protein and protein enriched foods from supplements like shakes, bars, and even cookies to otherwise ordinary everyday items like flour to granola and even chips and ice cream. All of this protein enhanced. Amazing. I have in my shopping bag both protein supplements and protein enhanced foods. In this episode, I break down how much protein we really need and if these protein packed products really pack the punch they promise. Both in World War One and World War Two, there was an attempt um, by the US government to ensure that um, soldiers at the front had enough food, particularly the kinds of food that were important and would enable men to fight best, and that was sources of protein. There is a need to conserve meat for soldiers, right? So there's a symbolic importance of meat as a kind of food that will give you strength. I think that gets reinforced, I should say, by some of the kind of nutrition science that's emerging in the late 19th century and early 20th century, which seems to confirm this idea. It's been decades since the war, but our pro-protein perception remains and our appetite for it continues to grow. Here's why protein's popularity will likely prevail. Most of us are gluttons for dieting advice, gobbling anything that promises smaller waistlines and better health. If I went on a low-carb diet, I would have to restrain myself from having carbs. But a high-protein diet lets me eat or drink more of what I already love, protein and retailers are ever ready to feed our protein obsession. In 2014, for example, milk marketers spent 50 million US dollars on a Milk Life campaign that packed eight grams of protein a glass. That's more than double the usual amount of protein. And between 2018 and 2020, we saw a 12% rise in new launches of food products promising to have a higher protein content. But what does protein actually do for our body? To find out for sure, I'm told to simply stand still and let the machine do all the work. Derek, why am I standing here? Yes, so this machine actually measures your muscle mass and your body fat. And how it does it is it passes a small electric current through you. You pull these handles up, okay, and then you put your thumb here. 
This is Derek Ong. As a sports dietitian, he has helped many people meet their recommended protein intake. Today, he's measuring my muscle mass. So with muscle mass, you can uh, you know, find out whether you need to be uh, eating more protein or eating protein in a different way. Protein helps build and maintain muscle mass. In other words, it provides us the strength to go about our daily activities. Okay. So Derek, how does it look? So your muscle mass is within the normal range, but your body fat is a bit on the high side. Whoa. <laughs> This episode is about protein, not fat, so we'll talk about that another time, right? Well, actually, Shrey, it's actually important to talk about body fat as well because when you build more muscle mass, it actually means that you have a higher basal metabolic rate and that helps you to burn body fat more efficiently. So I should be eating more protein and building my muscle mass to lose fat? Yes, that's correct, yeah. And it doesn't hurt to build more muscle mass when you're younger because as people age, people tend to lose more muscle mass. Every 10 years, most people tend to lose 3 to 5% of their muscle mass. Okay, but I'm only 27 now, so I have another 20 years to figure it out, right? Well, muscle mass starts to decline even from the age of 30. So you actually tend to lose muscle mass at a higher rate in your later years. As we age, uh, you tend to not only lose muscle mass but also gain body fat. So that's a condition we call sarcopenia. Excess body fat will actually lead to an increase in the risk of metabolic conditions like heart disease and diabetes. Some people, and this more the, the elderly, they lose so much muscle mass until it affects their ability to chew or swallow foods. And then also um, for low muscle mass, then you tend to have a lower immunity as well. Yeah, and then you're more susceptible to infections. So Derek, how important is it for me to start right now? Absolutely important, yeah. Now is the time to already start building muscle mass, making sure that you're eating enough protein every meal. So how much is enough protein? This amount varies from person to person, depending on age, gender, and what stage of life we are at. Depending on body weight, a child between ages 4 and 9 needs about 20 grams of protein a day. That's about 3 large eggs. As they grow into their teen years, the amount of protein they need more than doubles with boys needing about 50 grams of protein and girls 46 grams of protein. If you're pregnant, you'd need about 70 grams of protein a day or 12 large eggs, while older adults aged 50 and above need about 75 grams of protein, the equivalent of 13 large eggs a day. And this is how Whitex's diet looks like. Why? I'm about to find out that the amount of exercise we do also matters. Wow, Whitex, what do we have here? This is what I eat on a day uh, on average. Now that I've laid it out, right, it is quite shocking to me. It does look well. like a lot of food. <laughs> Let me show you my breakfast. This is 10 egg whites and 2 egg yolks that I've just fried myself. Lunch, brown rice, okay, and then I have beef with capsicums. I love a lot of vegetables. And this is fish. Two types of protein. It's either beef or fish or beef and chicken or pork. What do we have? So we have some snacks here. Uh, usually it's at 4 o'clock before I hit the gym or during the gym workout. So I have about uh, 2 to 3 scoops of uh, protein. Let's talk about your dinner. This is chicken breast, uh, also done very simply. I have tofu, I've got uh, beef slices and I've got vegetables. That's a lot of protein. Yeah, this is about 200 grams of protein. Why do you need this much in a day? I will need to take you to my second home to answer the question. Here is where former Mr. Singapore winner, Wai Tik, spends two hours a day, four times a week. I need more. One more. Oh, okay. Very good. One more. Everything? Yep. Okay. 
Thank you so much. All right. All right. Can I try? Sure. Okay. Go ahead. Watch your form, huh? Okay, well. your call, watch your back. Okay. <laughs> Are you tired already, Stray? You barely did anything. Why, Tick? Watching you has made me tired. Is this why you need that much protein? With the intensity and the amount of weights, there'll be some microscopic tears in the tissues and muscles. So I need a lot of protein. For repair and rejuvenation, I need that. Well, I clearly don't lift as much as you do, so how much protein would I need? First of all, what's your intensity in the gym? Three to five times a week. Mm-hmm. And your body weight? 79. 79, okay. Usually the calculation is based on about 1.4 grams to 2 grams per kilogram of body weight. So you should need about 110 grams of protein, thereabouts. Okay, why take? I lied. I, sometimes I can go one week, two weeks, a month without exercising, so what do I do then? If you're barely exercising, you actually only need about 63 grams of protein per day. Thereabouts. According to Y Tick, when I'm not exercising much, I need about 60 grams of protein a day, which is the equivalent of 10 eggs. And soon, I will need more and more to account for age-related muscle loss. I could make up these numbers with my normal meals, but would occasionally switching to protein-packed products and supplements provide the necessary proteins? For almost two decades, Dr. Naris Lapsis has been helping others improve their health through their diets. Dr. Nara, so I found out that protein supplements are really efficient forms of protein, but should we all be taking them? So no, we don't all need to be taking protein supplements. For many people, you, just the food that you eat in a day is more than ample. Protein supplements are a convenient way to get either additional protein if you've got certain needs, or if you're a fussy eater, for example, you might want to use a protein supplement to bring up those needs. Or you might be an athlete, you might be looking to lose weight. There might be times where a supplement being a bit more specific is perfect for you. If you're somebody who is aging, for example, losing muscle mass, it might be appetite's not so high, a protein supplement will do the job. So in that context, it's very good. Protein powders, protein supplements actually contain a real lot of protein and you can get those numbers up very quickly. One of the situations I find myself in, as an actor and as a host, my schedule is super erratic. So sometimes I'm missing out on breakfast, missing out on dinner, I just carry a protein bar or uh, have a protein shake with me. Is that a good idea to do, uh, to just replace my meal with protein supplements? That bar could have a reasonable amount of protein. It's got some fat in there, it's got some carbohydrate in there. So that's mimicking, in a sense, what a meal should have. And you'll feel satisfied to a certain extent and you'll be able to go about and do the things that you do in a day. So it's a convenient choice, but it's never going to replace real food. Because when you eat real food, then you're going to be getting all the vitamins, all the nutrients, so these things, they're okay to have from time to time, but it's not something that you would want to make a permanent habit of. So I was told that I need to lose a bit of body fat, put on a bit of lean muscle, grow my muscle mass, but how do I choose? I mean, all of them look like good protein supplements to me and all look pretty convenient, so how do I make a good decision? If the intention is to build the lean muscle and lose fat that you have, so first of all, you're looking for a product that's actually high in protein. So a good rule of thumb um, is if a product has got 15 grams of protein in its serving, that's a good starting point to say that anything 15 grams and above is probably what we would call a high protein bar. I was pretty excited by this one because it's a cookie. So if we have a look here, this one's actually nearly 250 calories. This is a very high calorie product that has got 
a significant amount of protein, but it's obviously got a lot of calories and fat. If your intention is to be losing body fat, yeah. you're looking first of all at the protein count and secondly, the total number of calories. So I've heard that it's best to use these post-workouts, right? Because we need protein to recover and heal our muscles. That's one of the, the most effective ways to use these when your intention is to build lean muscle. A person who is doing strength work, they've gone into the gym, they've literally broken muscle down. You're now providing an environment afterwards where the, you can get maximum muscle growth and recovery, and these protein supplements contain all of those ingredients that are important. To pick the right protein product for my needs, I'm reading the labels. But beyond the calorie count and nutritional facts, I'm also starting to notice the ingredients. Whey concentrate? Isolate? What do they all mean? What counts is actually how much of this absorbed protein are made available in the blood circulation. To pick the right protein supplement, I've been told I have to read the labels. But if you've seen the labels of these foods, you'll notice strange terms like whey concentrate, whey isolate, what are they? I'm hoping food scientist William Chen can enlighten me. So what's the difference between concentrate and isolate? Concentrate, basically, we're talking about making the protein portion uh, bigger from the raw materials, but it still has all the rest. Uh, for example, um, we talk about lipid, lactose, those uh, uh, other uh, components stay behind. Whereas, uh, when you talk about isolates, this is a process of removing lipid, fat, and the lactose. So it's a more enriched in the protein portion. Prof, so there's concentrate, there's isolate. Why choose one over the other? We isolate takes about 60 to 80 minutes to be absorbed because this is a pure protein. Whereas we concentrate takes about two, three hours. Does it really matter? Aren't these proteins all going to be absorbed in our body anyway? You're absolutely right in saying that eventually all these proteins will get absorbed. What counts is actually how much of these absorbed proteins are made available in the blood circulation. We call it bioavailability. Not all will be made available to the bloodstream. It's easier for the enzyme to reach a target in the isolated form, as opposed to the concentrate form of a protein. Protein isolate is digested and absorbed by the body faster, <sighs> making it the perfect companion for our workouts because it kickstarts the muscle repair process. Whereas protein concentrate, with its slow and steady release rate, it's much better for when I say, miss out on a meal, because it will help me be fuller for longer. But as Prof Chen says, not all the protein I eat will be bioavailable, which got me thinking. What happens to all the protein that doesn't get utilized by the body? Rachel Tay has helped patients with symptoms of excessive protein for over 10 years. Is excessive protein something to worry about? So if let's say we're talking about a healthy individual, generally excessive protein will just cause more burden on the kidneys and also the other metabolic organs like the liver to process the waste products. And also, um, from the point of view of weight management, taking a high protein diet might also involve taking more fat that's attached to the high protein food. So then this leads to weight gain as well and increased uric acid levels also. And what happens with high uric acid levels? Yeah, so people can actually develop this condition called gout when they have high uric acid levels, which is very painful joints. And in rare cases, having more proteins than the body can handle could be harmful. Excessive amount of protein intake for someone with kidney disease can hasten the process of the kidneys failing. So why is it that excess protein contributes to like a further deterioration of the kidneys? Mm, so it actually puts an additional strain on the kidneys. They have an increased burden of clearing all the waste products. If let's say the kidneys are on the verge of failing as well, then that's when they're not able to pass out the excess waste products. They get stored in the body and cause other effects like nausea, vomiting and weakness. 
So that it will actually lead to this thing called end-stage kidney failure, in which case patient will usually need dialysis. So how much protein is too much protein? We actually look at a few things when we give our recommendations for protein. We look at the patient's age, uh, gender, the level of physical activity, their medical condition as well. Mm -hmm. So if let's say someone were to take beyond their recommended protein, then that's considered excessive protein intake. So this is very individualised. So every person has to find out yes. what their recommended levels are yes. for their goals and also for their health. Yes. Is there a correct way of consuming protein? Generally, it's recommended uh, to not have all your protein for the day in one sitting. So we do recommend to spread out your protein intake across the day. So um, assuming an average individual needs about you know, 70 grams of protein a day for breakfast, you can have two slices of bread and then about 10 grams of protein can come from a cup of milk, another 10 grams from an egg, okay? And then for lunch, you could have 20 grams, okay, from the fish. And for dinner, you can have another 30 grams, which is also from a piece of fish or meat. That's about the size of a palm. And if, say, I am building muscle, mm. I would need a bit more protein. Yes. I can just add them a little bit in each meal? Yes, you can add a little bit more into each meal. Protein is without a doubt an essential nutrient that we all need. And it now even comes in the form of supplements and protein-enriched snacks so that we can get the quick fix that we might need. But most of us get enough amount of protein without even trying. As for me, I need to lose a bit of body fat. But perhaps the trick is not always eating less, but to eat the right kind of protein, the right amount of protein, at the right time. And of course, let the muscles do the work.